Hello and welcome to Café Montmartre, the video show about crypto art. In every show, we have one guest. Most of the time, it's an artist, can also be a gallerist, collector, anybody who is active in this exciting new art scene, crypto art. And today we have Johnny Dollar from the USA. He's not only an artist himself, he also curated a very interesting overview of crypto art at uh, Bit Basel, which happened in Miami a few weeks ago. So, hello, Johnny. Great to have you in our show. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Good to be here. Yeah. My first question. I mean, Johnny Dollar, you even admit this is not your real name. And, and you have this funny method that you sign paintings with your real name, and then you put some tape on it, and then you write Johnny Dollar. So why do you do that? Uh, I did it as a kind of a metaphor. Like okay. uh, the tape, if you want to know my real identity, you could just rip it off. That the tape was just kind of a metaphor for a false sense of privacy people have in the digital age. So it's not very well encrypted, so to speak. Yeah, it's not a good. Uh, you could say yeah, it's masking tape encryption. Like, <laughs> okay. Uh, that's this. It's kind of a criticism of all these like pseudo end-to-end -end description, but at, at the end, the CIA knows everything. Is that that the... Uh, you know, it? it's more less just that everyone thinks they have privacy and, and we don't. And I started doing this a few years ago mm -hmm. when uh, privacy was less uh, in the forefront. I mean, the last year it's become much, much more, uh, oh, people are much more aware than they used to be. Mm. Um, although, I, you know, privacy is a whole other conversation. I've, uh, I've run into people that don't like privacy. <laughs> um, so, yes, so. But these topics like privacy and you, you describe yourself as a crypto anarchist, is that correct? That these are topics that you uh, talk about in your art? Yeah, I would say I'm very much inspired by the old crypto anarchists. And, and I am. I am a crypto anarchist. Okay. Uh, you know, whatever that means, you know, it's kind of cryptic. It's a base of Bitcoin and everything, right? So uh, it it's, started, it's, eh? yeah, absolutely. That the crypto anarchists and the cypherpunks were among the, the, the movements that brought the uh, Mm -hmm. the, the you know the e-cash the bitcoin okay. the cryptocurrencies and how, how did you get into crypto art uh well you know i i was doing uh i've been a painter for many years and i got into cryptocurrency in late 2012 and uh, it you know like most people kind of takes over your mind you're trying to understand cryptocurrency you end up having to understand your own currency your your fiat currency mm -hmm. the dollar and just it just sort of happens and uh I, my paintings became inspired by these things and that's when um, you adapted the name johnny dollar when you when you got wanted the money or have you always used that that sort of no name? i started using it around the same time uh like a lot of things kind of converged at once my learning of you know cryptocurrency uh my uh experiences with privacy i, I got stalked and mm -hmm. just very briefly you know someone was uh and i realized about privacy there um, you know, as well, a lot of other things. And I had some problems with uh, a bank and some capital controls uh, many years ago. So okay. all these things kind of converged <clears throat> at once. Um, does that yeah. answer your question? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you yeah. became Johnny Dollar and you started with, um, well, talking about cryptocurrency more or less at the same time, but I guess crypto art came much later, right? Because the NFTs are- Well, you know, the, the word crypto phenomenon. art is, is, is a new word people are, are using for digital rare assets. Mm -hmm. um, crypto art's actually been around probably since the Sumerians in the sense of, or Babylonians of art that has a secret hidden message, you know, crypto okay. cryptographic art. And sure. I've been doing that. I've had paintings that had a, uh, a puzzle with a private key in them, done things like that, put secret messages. But what we're calling crypto art now um, is about two, two and a half, three years old with the mm. counterparty and the, and the tokenizing of art. So I guess we'll just to keep things, keep from confusing people, that seems to have taken yeah. over the term crypto yeah, art. They are, they are several interpretations of what crypto art is. I mean, now everybody talks about NFTs, but of course they have been uh, painters who have already, or, or artists who already do, did things with Bitcoin and whatever, the code and interactivity long before the NFT, right? Um, cryptography, oh, I guess correct. also, yeah. And I mean, and people have done cryptography, the crypto in crypto art, mm -hmm. for, for hundreds of years. I mean, in yeah. the Middle Ages, people would do a, like a hidden drawing. When they paint a king or a rich man, they might take 
morph him uh, and take a, a morph of him and put him in the painting. And if you had a special mirror, you could see that morph was a caricature making fun of him. Okay. Like people have been doing that for, you know, hundreds of years, crypto, you know, crypto art or just uh, boxes that had like a little puzzle and uh, you open it up and you find, you know, like a secret message or a treasure inside. That's, you know, crypto. Okay. That's an interesting interpretation. wide interpretation of that term. I like that. Yeah. So you do that, for instance, with, with QR codes in your paintings, right? These hidden messages. Maybe you, I have in a, a several paintings. I've yeah, added good. QR codes. I've uh, done some uh, stripes. I've done ones that I haven't told people about that. You know, I'm hoping people will discover at a future date. Okay. Um, yes. Let, let's let's have a look of some of your paintings first, right? Okay. Which sure. one shall we start with? Is it the one with with QR codes or? Okay, Donald. Uh, this one is called Donald Goes to the Dark Web. Mm -hmm. um, and the story behind it is, you know, Donald was enraged with jealousy. Okay. He saw his girl with another. So he went down to the dark web and using the private cryptocurrency Monero, he bought uh, augmentation weaponry and uh -huh. biohacked himself to go get revenge. This is a traditional painting, right? With whatever, oil or acrylic or anything like that? Or how did you do it's this? It's an acrylic uh, on canvas. Uh, okay. There is an augmented reality layer added to it. Ah, okay. And where I explain the painting, and I may do more with augmented reality, but on its own, it is a 2D, I guess, a, a physical painting. What what will happen when we... Uh, well, right now what happens is a, a, a video pops of, of me explaining the painting. I, I, yeah. may, I may add another animation as well, but uh, I have other paintings I'm moving forward with. Okay, and how do you connect this now with the NFT? I mean, you probably then have a digital copy of this painting, or how does it work? How do you how do you sell well, that on? You know, for this one, mm -hmm. I uh, I take a digital a, a high quality photograph, mm -hmm. and I tokenize the digital image. Although I tend to add a little more to them for the NFT. Mm -hmm. um, unlike traditional art, you know, when you would take a photograph of a painting, you want it to be as exactly like the painting as possible mm -hmm. to so the uh, a buyer or collector could get a, a, a correct representation of the painting um, but the nft is separate than the painting so the nft i'll actually heighten the colors or change it a bit so it, it's more uh, about pixels on yeah. the screen okay. if that makes sense so so if i buy the nft i get probably a high res jpeg right but do i also correct. own the painting will you then ship the painting to the owner of the NFT, or is it separate? No, no, I do not. No, okay. they're separate. Is it possible? I mean, can you just like paint all these Disney characters or do the Disney corporations sue you for that? Or is it like the freedom of art that you can just use these Well, characters? there's a freedom for artists. Yeah. Um, but a lot of my art has to do with copyright law. Well, you know, copyright law as well as patent law uh, have mm -hmm. been tools for the last... Uh, for many years to control uh, control lots of things from medicine uh, to food, but to culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, copyright uh, law has uh, evolved. Um, I know in the U.S. it was, I believe, 1991, the Sonny Bono Act. There was a senator who was also used to be a musician, Sonny Bono, mm -hmm. uh, sponsored an act which extended the copyrights till 2023. Uh, and the reason he did that was he was funded by the Disney Corporation because they were going to lose Steamboat Willie, the okay. original Mickey Mouse. From it's going to go also, yeah. the public domain. Yeah, it's a guy uh, from Sonny and Cher, right? The, the yes, exactly. That's Cher, him. Right? Sonny Bono, okay. Sonny yeah. Cher. Yeah, I got you, babe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that guy, he tried to, uh, well, he did. He successfully, you know, had this law and it, it, it went international to where uh, originally copyright was, I believe, 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it was like artist's life and it was artist's life plus 20 years. Uh, he made it artist life plus 75 years. Okay. So Walt Disney has long been dead. Um, and most of Walt Disney's uh, greatest hits came from public domain. Folk tales like Pinocchio, Cinderella. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Little Mermaid, you know, is, is public domain, but Hans Christian Andersen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, their biggest hit came from the public domain. And that's how culture's always been, you know, artists, you know, we create new things, but some things are everybody's, you know, mm -hmm. like everybody owns Sherlock Holmes now. 
in, in, the, in a sense, like you can make a Sherlock's home story and not ask anyone's permission. And that was just one generation before Mickey Mouse mm. or Batman or Superman, all these, these things that are owned by corporations that now use these things to control our culture. If you get what I'm saying, because uh, totally, yeah. we, so, this we all, is a topic that you talk about in your That's why you use Donald Lark uh, that, and that yeah, Mickey Mouse. Yeah, yeah. I see, yeah. Actually, the next. This is a great segue to the next painting. Is this one? Okay, the Bank of Babel. So it's kind of the Tower of Babel in the modern times of fiat money, or why, why the Bank of Babel? Correct. It's uh, you know, uh, uh, it's I, the story I go with it is Mickey's broken the shackles of the copyright cartel. Okay. And he's used Bitcoin to not only free himself, but to free us all by burning down the towering bank of Babel. Uh, break his chains and okay. No okay. longer being held by the this cartel. Okay. Uh, that controls the data. The uh, mm -hmm. I mean in a sense a lot of this comes back to data, you know, the copyright, who controls these ideas. Okay, and, and Disney never went against you, say, hey, you cannot use it. Oh, all. no, man, they, I'd love it if they did. They don't want this. <laughs> okay, exposed. yeah. Um, let's let's maybe switch to the next painting. This is a Cookie Monster, right, from the Sesame Street. Yes, yes. The title of this painting is called Show Me Your Cookies. It was inspired by an academic paper uh, called Show Me Your Cookies and I'll Tell You Who You Are. And in that paper, the, the, the writers were looking at people's browser cookies. And they, uh, what we know now, but they didn't know then, they discovered that with people's browser cookies, they could not only tell a person's age, race, gender, but they could tell where they lived, where they went to school, uh, what they were going to do in the future. Uh, oh, a lot okay. of information. And, and we know that now. So, this, yeah, this painting was inspired by that, and it's called mm -hmm. Show Me Your Cookies. Cool. And the QR codes, uh, what's what's the secret message here? I guess it's okay. something hidden, right? If I know you. Yes. All those QR codes are scannable mm -hmm. and they lead to a different place online. And uh, they uh, they tell a loose narrative, a story, depending on where you start, where you end. Mm -hmm. um, but they also contain a, a, a public and a private key. So there's, an, uh, there's a wallet in this painting. And the story behind it is the cookie monster's consuming data. Yeah. He can't stop. He's just compulsively nom, nom, nom more data. Mm -hmm. And this woman walks naked through a digital landscape. And as she walks, she's being tracked by birds. Okay. I don't know if you can see them, but there's lots yeah, yeah, of birds. Yeah, yeah. I like the Hitchcock birds. Yeah, I like more yeah. scary birds that I like pecking, picking down. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so they're following her and she doesn't know it. And if you, buy, you kind of, when you see it, they sort of, form the cookie monster. Mm. Um, okay, the cookie monster is made of these birds, kind of, okay, I see it, yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, it's so, all about privacy and that we're not really, pri that we all, everybody knows about kind of the- Correct, uh, okay. correct. Like I said, a lot of information comes in those QR codes. Mm. Now, uh, now earlier we talked about uh, medieval cryptography mm -hmm. and I had mentioned, so there's a public key and a private key. And I'll tell you, because the, the, the puzzle has been solved. Uh, there was some Ethereum as well as an NFT in this painting, okay. and someone uh, was able to get it out. The private key is the QR in the cookie. Okay, I see. So that's a medieval cryptography. So uh -huh. like I said, back in the day, if that painting was laid flat and you took a cylinder and put it in the middle of that cookie, a reflective cylinder or a wine bottle, and you wrap like a shiny metal around it, mm -hmm. the reflection in the cylinder of the round QR code will be a square. I see. So in this form, I can I guess it will not be scannable. You have to put the cylinder in and only then the mirror image you can scan, correct? Correct. Or ah, you know, okay. if you if you are a Photoshop whiz, um, you can do a math formula and and alter it. But yes, okay. that is the traditional way. Okay. So and that guy your hacker, so to speak, he got he got some money out of it, yeah, some ether or, or the or the NFT of that painting. He got he got free. both. He okay, got, okay. Uh, but interesting, Aaron. I've shown this painting, and people have found the public key and added more money to it. Oh, and then nice. removed. So it's had money t put in and taken out yeah. of it several times. Just that you didn't get it, but your the the, the hacker, yeah, so the, the, the one with the cylinder. Okay, well, okay, he yeah. deserves it, right? Absolutely. That's what it was there. Guy. 
Cool. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Uh, you have another one, right? You have four pages, yes. you said. Okay. Yes. Let's, and, let's uh, switch to number four then. Okay. Number we... four. This is this painting. It oh, okay. is titled Pygmalion. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a large painting. I just finished it. And this one has an, an augmented reality layer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will show after we look at it. Ah, okay. So there's some animation when you when you Correct. put your mobile phone on it and look at it, then some animation yeah. will start, right? Yes. If okay. you download an app called Artivive, uh -huh. it's A-R-T-I-V-I-V-E. We put um, in the link. So on Android okay. or iOS, and okay. you can scan this painting and the animation will play. That's kind of the standard for augmented reality now in the crypto art scene. This Artie Vive, uh, uh, there's it, several apps. There's several. It it seems to be the first one I found. I know Josie Bellini, uh, Bellini. I believe that's mm -hmm. how you pronounce her name. Josie mm -hmm. uses it as well. Um, but there are new ones. I'm pretty sure it'll eventually be a standard on like everyone's phone, um, eventually. So we may switch. But Artie Vive mm -hmm. has taken the lead for now. Yeah, okay. And just for the people who may be not so familiar with, with augmented reality, a very uh, popular example of this was Pokemon, right? That you went to the real world, had your mobile phone, and then in some real world places, you would find some virtual Pokemons that just lived on the moon. So this connection between real life and uh, cyberspace, that's augmented reality. Is that correct? Is that a good definition? Correct. Absolutely correct. It's uh, unlike virtual reality, which this painting is about, mm -hmm. uh, Augment, which is going in another world, augment reality is augmenting, adding something to our existing reality. Okay. So, so it's, it mixes in this, reality. In this case, the existing reality is a painting. And then on top, there can be either an explanation, as you do, did with the other one, or in this case, it's something which adds it, on, it, right? So an animation, some additional correct. layer of art. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. If you have yeah, any questions good. about the painting, I can. Yeah, uh, sure. Well, yeah. What's it? What's the, You said it's about virtual reality. Obviously, this guy has goggles. He gets into that kind of time tunnel. It, it reminds me of that old science fiction series. So they, um, yeah, no, it's really, you know, there's the guy with uh, the Oculus goggles on, the, the girl, there's the dog, there's mm -hmm. the Pinocchio. Uh, doll in the corner you can't do without disney right there has to be a disney uh, character otherwise yeah, yeah. Okay. you know it, it has it has it's always has its meaning yeah um there's the story of pygmalion is an ancient uh myth okay yeah well, i'm looking forward to see the animation to that can you show it okay let's okay. let's pull it up uh you know you see the the tv screen kick on and the, the woman's playing I reference um, a film called Pygmalion. Yeah. It was remade again with Audrey Hepburn and called My Fair Lady. Yeah. And I reference that as well. Mm. Just a uh, brief, that's why you make a lady. I see it. Okay. Just a brief clip. Uh, My Fair Lady is the same story. It's where a man falls in love with his own creation. And then suddenly you became the guy with the goggles and suddenly all this virtual reality disappears. Well, and you know, it, it's my take on VR. I got the VR goggles, the Oculus headset, mm -hmm. uh, during the beginning of lockdown. I was like, okay, I'm going to do VR art. This is the future. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm going to paint with this tilt brush and build these things. So I put on, I got the goggles. I ordered them in the mail. They came, you know, it's, you know, beginning of March, height of lockdown. It's, you know, all you could hear outside is the wind blowing, the leaves and trash bags. And, you know, so I got these goggles. I'm in my own world, going to make art. I put them on and Aaron, first thing, one of the first things I do is I check out porn, an okay. adult. Oh. Yeah, you know, it's funny. No you know, big I surprise. Yeah. Same saying that, but everyone that has a VR headset, I mentioned that to them and they looked at me like, of course you did. That's the first thing you would do, of course. <laughs> so I did, and it was an incredible experience. Like it fooled my senses, mm. you know, I don't even think it was just such an such an intense experience. And I took off the headset. You know, I was in this mansion in this VR world with this beautiful women. And I'm looking around. It's just, you know, this amazing place. I take off the headset. And I'm in my crappy little studio. <laughs> okay. Uh, I see you. So. Um, so I put them away. Okay. And then, you know, again, I tried them again. And I started kind of work with them a little bit. And, you know... I did another VR experience and the second time, you know, I took them off and it wasn't like I took them off and I was like, you know, oh, my reality. I was like, I took them off, but I felt like I put on another pair of goggles mm. when I took off the first pair. 
it was really fooling my mind. Like it was a, it was very dystopian, kind of blue pill matrix style yeah. in the sense of, and I could see it's a benefit. People love it. I can see it's the future for medicine. It's the future yeah. for, uh, you know, training, all, all kinds of things. But for me personally, I, I, I don't like it. I don't like how uh, Oculus is being bought by Facebook. Mm. Uh, so big tech is honing in on this stuff, you know, just as like television is addictive and can put us in a trance state and you, you know, can be used to, you know, not only like teach you, but, you know, manipulate you as we all know. And the opera uh, even stronger, right? Because it yeah, is, they call it television yeah. programming for a reason. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so VR is like you said, even stronger. It's more of your senses. It's it. And we're giving, ceding that control over to big tech to be entertained, to be educated, all these things. I, like I said, I, this was an alarm for me, mm. and uh, that's that was the experience. And I, I gave away the Oculus headset last uh, uh, okay. month. Okay, so I was like, the, yeah, I'm, this is yeah, no, it's not for me. So it was um, your last piece of VR. Yes, right? this was my this was my my take, my homage to VR. Mm. Um, I hope that people will buy your paintings to find out what your true identity is. Uh, we, we won't disclose it now. I just say bye bye, Johnny Dollar. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. And thanks everybody for watching Café Montmartre. If you want to be invited yourself, if you're an artist or a gallerist, if you're active in the crypto art space, just uh, fill out this little form. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the show and see you next time.